So this video, we're gonna be sort of introducing the Cartesian plane or the XY plane as you probably have heard of it. So uh, before I sort of dive into the math and mechanics as a quick sort of history piece, uh, the Cartesian plane is actually named after the guy who sort of invented it, Rene Descartes. So Rene Descartes is sort of famous for a number of reasons. He's a philosopher, mathematician. Um, he's arguably most famous for having that cognito ergo sum, the I think therefore I am, that's, that's this guy. And the story, as the story goes, you know, inventing the Cartesian plane, which may or may not be apocryphal, but it's a great story. While laying in bed one day, he was very bored and he's looking up at the ceiling and he sees a fly on the ceiling and he sees the fly sort of moving around on the ceiling and he wants to figure out if I were to try to describe this thing moving around on the ceiling, how would I do that? So he starts watching the fly very carefully as the fly moves around on the ceiling. And after a little bit, he realizes, well, if I told somebody sort of the exact distance from the two walls that that fly was at different points in time, I could sort of trace out sort of a pathway that it, that it went through, right? If I knew it was exactly two feet from this wall and one foot from that wall, that's a specific spot on the ceiling that the fly would be. And with enough of these sort of points of reference, you could describe the path of this fly. And that's what gave sort of the impetus to create the XY plane, which is what we use now. And that's why it's called the Cartesian plane after Rene Descartes, okay? So a little bit of history injected here, but to the math, Cartesian plane. So the Cartesian plane is this sort of way of looking at input and output variables. So what we would commonly say X and Y, but as we sort of have looked at or discussed, that's not always the case, right? They could be different letters or whatnot. So we have the independent, independent variable as this sort of horizontal line, and the output or the dependent variable is the, the vertical line. For the sake of sort of everybody's sanity, I'm gonna to refer to these as the X and Y axis. But again, these are placeholders, right? The important part is it's the independent versus dependent, okay? So in order to graph something on the Cartesian plane, just like we were thinking about that, right, the fly a moment ago, we wanna know sort of relative distances from those points of reference. So we associate each output, each Y value, to a corresponding input or X value, and those give us those distances, right? So we write these things as a coordinate pair, and we call those things points. So if we have, for example, an input of three and an output of seven, we would put these things together and we would call this the point, quote, three comma seven, right? That's how we would say this, where that three is the first value, seven is the second value, right? Because we have the X value, the input is the first one, the Y value, the output is the second one. And Again, to be clear, right, order is very important here, right? The X value goes first, the Y value goes second, okay? So if we want to actually make a graph of a function, we would do that, right, just with the fly. We need sort of enough points of reference to, to figure out the path that it takes. So we graph a number of these X, Y points, and assuming the function is continuous, right, our fly doesn't teleport around or something, we try to make some relatively smooth curve that connects the points in some sort of sane way, and the hope is that we sort of get it close enough, right? Again, remember, graphing is not uh, very precise, even if it's accurate, right? So we, we're trying to get it sort of close to as sort of true as possible, even though it's sort of inherently not going to be exactly precise. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have this function 2x squared minus 5x plus 3, and we have no idea what this sort of function looks like if we graph it. Well, we would sort of figure out how it works by making points, and we would make points by plugging in x values to get y values. So let's say we wanna plug in x equals negative one. So we would do that by plugging in the negative one as the x, right? So we replace the x with negative one, which means we replace the x in the rule everywhere with that negative one. And then we run down the rabbit hole of computing this thing, right? So we do two times negative one squared, that's two, negative five times negative one, that's gonna be a plus five, right? And the three is still the three, put those together, we get f of negative one is 10. So this tells us that because f of negative one is 10, that that y value corresponding to negative one is 10, okay? Which means that it gives us this point, right? When we plugged in negative one, 
we got 10, so that means that we have the point negative 1, 10. And we do this with a bunch more x values. So you would plug in 0, turns out we get 3, get the point 0, 3. Plug in 1, we get 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, right? We just go through and make all these different points. Okay, so now we have a scattering of points. Now we need to figure out what this thing looks like by putting them on a graph. So we draw our x, y axis, right? Grab our table of points and start putting these things down. So when we have, for example, the negative 1, 10, that means that our x value is negative 1. So we go to the negative 1 x value. And then we go up to 10 for the y value. And that's where the point goes, negative 1, 10, right? And we keep going. So we have the point 0, 3. That's at the x value 0. So it's on the y axis. Up 3, we get 0, 3. 1, 0, 2, 1, 3, 6. 4, 16, 4, 15, right? So we place these things that we got from our table on here. Now we want to be able to make some sort of sane smooth curve, right? So we want to look at these things as points and draw some sort of curve between them that is relatively smooth, right? Sort of uh, a smooth action with your hand while you're drawing, while you're drawing them and make it sort of relatively nice looking as best you can. Again, there's a lot of like hand waving here because this is not a precise process. That's the whole point of graphing. The idea is to give you sort of an idea of what is happening. Personally, I like to pick some point that I know sort of in the middle-ish. So maybe I would pick the point like 1, 0 down here and go in one direction from there and then backtrack and go the other direction from there. So I might go from here to the right and get this sort of nice smooth curve to the right. And then I go back to that 1, 0 and draw the part that goes to the left where now I'm going off, right, up and away to the left. And notice that uh, I put these little arrows up here because I know that there are sort of more points in either direction, right? I didn't stop. The domain didn't end. So those arrows tell me that the curve sort of goes that way forever, right? It just keeps going on and on and on and on. So those, those arrows are actually deceptively important when graphing because it tells you that the, the domain didn't end. I just couldn't fit any more of the graph in the sort of space I was using. Okay, And that's really all there is to it, right? You, you graph the points, connect the points in some relatively nice smooth arc or whatever sort of shape fits, and that's your graph. All right. So what do we do? Well, we introduced, right, the Cartesian plane named after Rene Descartes and his boredom of watching flies moving around on the ceiling and deciding how to discuss them accurately with friends as math people do because we have loads of fun in our free time. <laughs> and we talked about points and how to get points from functions, how to put them on a graph, and then how to connect those points into some relatively sort of nice representative curve for the original function. So that is that.